Okay, so this is an episode of Entrepreneurs in Vehicles Getting Beverages. Our vehicle today is a private jet. I'm here with my main man, Stefan Georgie, and I'm going to set this down, and then we're going to raise it up a little, maybe. And we are about to have... I wanted to try and get him coming out of the bathroom here um, and catch him off guard, but this is the first beverage little bit of Macallan 12 that they have on here, you know. You know, of course. Of course. And uh, cheers, man. Cheers. So this is my first private flight, and uh, not his first. And we are uh, going to monetize this flight by recording some content for you. And uh, we're going to talk about money and persuasion and whatever else we want to with no limits on our conversation. Yeah, cannot wait. And hopefully this audio is beautiful. I've got a special vlogging kit that I bought today at a random like shop in New York. So uh, we're gonna get going here. We're gonna chat. We're gonna time to drink the drink. Yeah. It's 11:20 a.m. It's, it's gonna have a late start to the day. Um, yeah. Normally I start at 8 a.m. Yeah. I've got to talk a little louder than normal because my weird whatever baritone. I don't know the, what I the have. Registry of your voice. It's it's too quiet, so I need to enunciate. And uh, and we're just gonna look here. Also look at the lens, just for you. I know you don't right. done as much video. No, no, I haven't. I'm professional. Right. Um, so let's just start out by talking about how this whole thing even came about of us deciding to take this private jet from New York to Vegas. Yeah, I mean, it was really... Well, we ran into each other outside a bar. Literally, I actually came up, actually says, on the street in New York, outside of a bar, and I walked up and I said, what are you doing? And I did my Batman voice, and his wife was like, well, we're about to die. And, and uh, I actually got instantly uh, very hard, <laughs> which I wasn't expecting, but... Um, I was. It's, yeah. it's weird. It's, a, it's called a, a fear boner. Actually, I literally, that's so weird. I restarted watching The League. You yeah. watched it? Yeah. One of the best shows ever. And I've been re-watching that show. And so last night, as I was going to bed, I was watching the episode called Fear Boner. So that's really weird. It is weird. Exactly um, how I thought we'd start this video. So, yeah, so I started, I had this, this Fear Boner. And I mean, it's really, really rigid. Um, and uncomfortably erect. But eventually it goes away. And we go up, we're having drinks. Um, you are at this party. Great. And as a set of comedy set, does a great job. Um, as we're leaving, though, I talked about I told how we took a private jet here. My family, my wife, um, and my daughter, and this little baby. Over there. And, uh, yeah, she's over there. You, you, you may hear, or she may make a cameo later. She'll make a cameo. I would imagine. Um, but how it was great. And it's like, oh, well, if you want to do one on the way back, like I'll hop on. And I was like, well, if we can find a way to yeah, and we can make something, make some content, and like find a way to pay for the flight right and so and part of it that's been sort of interesting is what i've been writing to my list over the past week is about these restrictions we have in money in certain areas so i'll find that i'm rather abundant in most aspects but then at certain times on like one trip i'll be like well i don't want to spend much on hotels this trip but i'm i'm like fiddling over like a few hundred dollars that ultimately doesn't matter at all and so i'm like well why is this restriction coming up and i just try and surrender to let it go leaning into those areas where the restrictions come up because we all have certain areas where we're weird about it like we get weird about money in certain areas and so just letting go and I just continue to imagine anytime I have any feeling of restriction imagining just way more coming in more and more and this is one of those and, I, and on the flight over I was like I gotta get on a private plane it's just not flying coach all the like and I'll, I'll fly first class sometimes and I'll fly coach sometimes and part of me goes well, I like Coach because it's a character thing. Yeah. But then you get on a private plane and you immediately go, no, that's a lie. That is a lie you tell yourself to feel okay about flying a coach. But so the fact that this happened and we thought, I think what most people think is, so it costs, what, 20? 20, about 24000 24000 So people go, well, that's an insane amount. But instead, Stefan thinks this, and this is how I think as well. Well, instead of thinking it as an expense, how can I not only pay for the 24000 but potentially turn this into something worth far more. And so last night, we get on a phone call. We're in New York, but we had to, we're on the phone, and we just come up with this idea of helping people get clients. And we're like, why don't we just make a video on the jet 
we'll do a little run-up video on the runway. Um, we didn't run, we walked, it's a walkway. And uh, and we were just like, hey, we're gonna talk about money and persuasion, you probably saw that video and that's why you're here. And it took us a minute. And then we're like, let's just create whatever content we wanna make and talk about this. But so, we literally, basically constructed an entire business plan over the course of about an hour. And then yeah. Stefan sends me this email, he goes, I just brain farted out a couple of thoughts. Don't feel like you have to read whatever. And it's like a seven page document of like incredible ideas laid out for how we can sort of ROI this. To be the way we want to give free stuff. Do you want to talk about what that product's gonna be? Not in like a, to pitch you now watching this video way, but just because it's germane to like the idea and the formation of it. I think yeah. it's worthwhile. So conceptually, yeah, it's about how to get more clients if you're like a freelancer. So, you know, I'm a copywriter primarily. I do tons of other stuff as well. Same thing with Ian. Um, and we just see that as a huge... That's both where we got our start was yes. in writing for other people. Yes. And have both made more than most people doing that from less work. Right. And so we were like, hey, what, what could we offer people that they would really actually want. Right, and the, what we kind of realized, and, and this is to Ian's credit, his idea was, Ian and I are different, and, and like everyone's different, but Ian is, um, <laughs> Human. It's, it's clearly more extroverted. Like, Ian does a stage, go get up on stage, talk. Ian is the first one in line, jumping up on that stage and doing that. I do not mind public speaking. Um, I don't mind, I like, like going to events, I think that's valuable. But by nature, I'm probably a little bit more introverted and what Ian realized was like, so those are two different ways. There's one way to get, he has a way to get clients, which is about being an extrovert. And I have a way that's maybe more introvert focused. And so I think that's, we, we realize that's kind of missing is that people have their one method and it's a one size fits all approach yeah. um, versus us where we have these two different kind of methods. And so realizing that we're like, we can do a total, um, we do a course of training on this. Yeah. We can do like a live event where we have people come out to Vegas for a day. Um, I started jotting down ideas. And again, to Ian's point, Yes, we get paid a ton. I, you know, make uh, you, 50, you, yeah, 50 grams for, 50 grand for a sales upfront. letter uh, up front. You're always up front. Um, performance bonuses, commissions. I've been doing that for a long time now. Gross, you know. Yeah, it didn't start out at that right. price range. And that's important. But I've learned a ton of stuff about working with clients, like from referrals to dealing with difficult clients to getting them to be okay with your prices when you do want to charge more to getting your very first clients. Like there's so many things that I know about because it's not just like, good for me, I'm at this place now where I can charge a ton of money and make a ton of money, but it's also like, how did I get there? And then how can other people do the same thing? It is replicable. And the promise is not, you're gonna start making $50,000 for a sales letter, right. but it's a replicable process and there's things you can do to get more clients with less effort. Um, and it's not even about like getting better at what you do, it's just I'm approaching it differently. So I would love to share that knowledge because I'm passionate about it. And I know you feel the same way, Ian. Yeah, and part of like our discussion about it was, First of all, like, let's just make a video with no agenda later on of like, we'll talk about money and persuasion and our beliefs around it and stuff that we've learned. He's sold five to $600 million worth of stuff. I've sold over $100 million worth of stuff. So I'm five times less valuable as a human than he is. But like, that's a lot of combined sales experience and knowledge in a relatively short period of time. Yes. And so like, well, we can talk about that. We can talk about money. We can have fun. We can. I was like, I'm not gonna have my first private jet experience and not have a drink. So uh, I'm having a drink. He's not. He's gonna work later. I'm. I'm not. <laughs> and so, uh, but it was like, what can we do? And I, I actually have a confession: is I was on the toilet when we were having that conversation. <laughs> but I was sitting there, and I was like, what about an introverted, extroverted client, like freelancing system? Because I've created a lot of products around helping writers, around helping marketers, coaches, consultants, but the thing that I haven't created because I, I had a moral dilemma with it and an ethical issue is I don't want to create a product around getting clients <laughs> because hey, you can come by. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. Because I feel like my methods will not work for everyone. They'll work really well for the people that it suits their personality. But my methods, and I've done some stuff like cold stuff, but it's basically been meeting people in a, in a person and just having fun and having drinks with people and being slightly likable. A lot of people actually used to really not like me, so that's, you don't have to be likable. But I got my stuff, like him and I met at an event in Paris actually, staying at a chateau in Paris, the first ever Lytopez video. Yeah. He was there for it. And so, um, 
that's been my method and I don't want to teach that to people who that doesn't suit. So I want to be able to help everybody that has like no matter what their personality type, but I think people have these freelancing systems not based on people's personalities and that's an issue because it's not going to work. And there is no one guaranteed path to clients. It doesn't exist. There's a bunch of different ways. So it just seems to work. And so that's, I think, part of the reason for us to even explain that is people get really complex. We got to launch a business. We got to do this. We're like, well, what if we film one video on a plane? We film one video leading up to it. We film one on it, a long content video that we give to people for free with no agenda. And then maybe later for the people on the list, we go, hey, we're going to do this. And then on top of that, we're like, okay, well, I could fly out to Vegas for a day. We just film the content and we record it and then we have this product. Yep. And then we're like, well, actually, what if we fly people out, or not fly them, but have people come out to an event for one day, we record the event, we get paid to create the content, and then we sell the content later, and then it all, like, we're literally getting paid to create our product, instead of, and with zero risk, because if nobody buys, if nobody wants to show up to the event, which is unlikely, we didn't lose any time, we that's it so I, I know so many people one of my close friends that was at this event spent months developing this one product and found out that he did not know the market he has really good product but he didn't know the price point the offer and so he put in all this time before finding out that people don't even want it or they don't want it at the price point he's offering it at. so it's like I think the difference is you go well 24,000 that's a lot of money and you go well you already said what's happened to you today this is crazy yeah, this is absolutely true. Is um, well, first of all, on the flight out to New York, which I took with my family, the same plane. Um, the next day, somebody hired me for a fifty thousand dollars sales letter. So I spent twenty four thousand, got hired for second for fifty thousand. Another client reached out to me and said, um, "Hey, I'm gonna do a referral right now. She's already pre sold. It'll be fifty to sixty thousand dollar thing. I'm like, great." Um, so. Like the multipliers on that alone are crazy. And I know it sounds silly. I want to actually get into that. This abundance mentality is it really that simple. We'll come back to that. But I do want to mention, yeah, then today, same thing. Still was like, man, I don't know, 24,000. That's like 50,000 round trip. But, you know, booked it yesterday, uh, I guess, afternoon. And then this morning, a uh, former business partner of mine slash client reached out, wants me to rewrite something for him. It'll take me, honestly, like an hour. And he's going to end the, the race $5,000 plus these um, incentives and bonuses up to like twenty thousand dollars, so, so even if it's just control. five, yeah. So that's still twenty percent of For the cost hour. of this yeah. right now. And then somebody reached out to me, wanted to join the mastermind that Justin and I have, which is a copywriting mastermind. Um, if you've been on the fence, message me this morning. Hey, I'm signing up right now. Uh, that mastermind is eighteen thousand a year. So out of that, I'll make nine thousand. My partner will make nine thousand. So combined, that's fourteen thousand dollars that I made. This morning, this morning, doing nothing but waking up, packing, getting on this plane, and now shooting this video. And I know that sounds, it sounds almost crazy, I, but I really do believe in this stuff because this just happens in my life. I don't know what to tell you, and I'm not the only one, and Ian's not the only one. And like, so there's all these things going on because it's like, one, have the abundance mentality, spent the money, now I'm already making all the money back. But on top of that, also being smart, and I'm not just sitting there waiting for it to all come, that's great when that happens but how do we monetize it? How do we, so now we've created a business and the reason I sent Ian seven pages of ideas for the product we're gonna sell is because I'm truly passionate about it, but I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't even ever do this product if it wasn't for wanting to take this private jet plane. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm, I'm passionate well, no, about I'm, it, I'm excited about it. And it's been a gap in my business even is teaching that, but I'm not willing to create an average product. I just don't feel okay with it. So I wanted to, this just happens to work out. I had no idea of making any client products on it. And the other thing is, just for the context of this video, neither one of us need to do this in order to be okay financially. Right. It's like, this is fun for us, but we also like to, I get paid to have fun. That's essentially my job yeah. in life, is to get paid to have fun. So I'd love to teach people and help them grow. And I mean, and there's stuff within that realm that we can uniquely teach. And so, and even like for us to create a product together, it's not, well, what can we create? It's what could only, like, what could we only create? Like. You and I, what are our unique skills that only you and I could create this product? Not just a product. But so, and I think it's one of the things that people look at things as expenses. And so it's the same with uh, with my rent. And I finally made this video. I didn't want to do it because it's this stuff all sounds douchey and I'm just going to not try and justify that anymore. You've gotten that out of the way. We're not trying to be douchey. 
or arrogant with any of this. This is us sharing our beliefs around abundance and money. And so I moved into this place in, in Venice in California, the Santa Monica area, and it's $9,000 a month for rent. And people go, that's insane, you're stupid, you should buy, why would you waste that on rent? And I go, okay, I understand the logic of your argument, but if I do one private consulting day, which is $9,000, I pay for my rent in a month. If all I did was a half day for five grand, I'm basically paying four grand a month to live in a 2,000 square foot three bedroom place with a 1,500 square foot rooftop overlooking the ocean. So, and, and, and I also, this is the other thing that I truly believe, even if I don't do the consulting days, what if looking at the ocean and living right next to the ocean makes me happier and makes me more useful and more productive and I meet these people? Who's to say my income isn't going to take a massive leap just because I'm experiencing more joy and more energy in my life? And okay, so I have to pay for that. That's not an expense. Or, or I go pay four or 5000 to live in a place that I'm okay with. And I know that's a lot, and I know, but it's like, it's that view of not can I pay for this, but how am I going to pay for this? And how can I make more from this? And I don't think many people think that way. I think that, going back to the, this is, I think this is a mindset thing, but for me, um, this has helped a lot, is like, when it comes to celebrating your successes or living the life that you want to live, like, I've, I've come to be like, there's always going to be a percentage of people who just hate you for that. Like, right? Who they're going to hate you, despise you, be envious, jealous, bitter, angry, whatever it is. But like, that's their problem and not my problem. And I, that, I don't mean it's a douchey thing either. No, it's, it's like it's I can't. Their, it's actually their shame, and they're trying to push yes. their shame on you. Exactly, and I can't. I can't let that. What? What? So I shouldn't live the life that I want to live, or the best version of my life, the life that makes me the happiest, the most productive, the most fulfilling. And by the way, a huge part of my life, like I like comfort, which is why I like private jets. But I love teaching, which is why I run a mastermind with like over a hundred people in it, where I'm teaching them how to like be better copywriters, where they then can. For, some of them are freelancers, and they're furthering their career. They're getting more clients. We have an actual jobs like Facebook group now, where people come to me for jobs I don't want to do, or that I'm it's not the right fit. We give them to them. There's it's flooded with great paying jobs for these people. That now they're making more money. They're changing their lives. They're getting better as a result of it. And you've got business owners who are enrolling their copywriters. So for them, they're doing better in their career. They're getting promotions. They're expanding their knowledge base. They'll go on to do amazing things. Um, and like, I get to teach all of these things. And like, if that, that's like one of my whys. I'm, I'm a teacher, I really am, and I love doing that. And so like, but why- you're also a good teacher. Well, thank you, man, I, I appreciate that. But like, why am I gonna let somebody, I'm not gonna do that because some random person like, you know, thinks I'm a douchebag for, you know, doing something that I, makes me happy and fulfills my life. Like, doing this jet right now, again, now we're gonna create this program and we don't have to do it, but like, I wanna do it. And it's like, so now, like, that, that's that's awesome. Now I'm being fulfilled. Well, it doesn't feel like work either. That was the thing is I was like, I don't want to just take on some new event that we run or some new product just to make money. Right. Once we started talking about it, I'm like, oh, this is exciting. I, we're going to get paid to go hang out with people and help people. And there's no way that those people that come in aren't going to make way more from what they've done. If I, the weirdest thing for me about freelancing, and we're not even trying to talk about that specifically. This is more conceptual about, like, money and the way people look at it is, when I started out freelancing after I'd left the copywriting job that I had had with the company, I didn't know how to set up the contracts of like, how do I get paid? And it's one of those weird things where unless you have examples, you can't know what you don't know. And I ended up making a lot literally because of the way I set it up. And so it's the same thing in a lot of industries where people go, well, if I get better as a personal trainer, I'm going to make more money. Well, not likely. As long as you're good enough, you'll probably, you need to get more clients or charge more. So copywriters, they're like, oh, I need to get better at writing. And I'm like, no, you're good enough. You need to get better at getting the right deals, starting your, you know, doing your business right. And so it's like looking at all of these things from this different perspective of how can I have fun earning money and hanging out with a friend? Because the other thing is I wouldn't want to do this alone. Right. Because then it's me with all of the pressure of this event and this thing. And Stefan and I have never gotten to actually sell something together right. we've i've spoken at his mastermind we've done a lot of stuff hanging out but like we've never created something and that'll be super fun I agree. for us like where we get to write a sales page together and like create videos and do stuff i'm getting paid to hang out with one of my close friends that's a pretty awesome thing and i think people can easily look at it and go it's easy for you to say the two white guys on a plane 
you know, on a private jet. Like, it's easy. And it's like, yeah, but that wasn't obviously always our lives right. either. Um, but it's, uh, it, dude, I got a really funny email from this person. They asked me a question. Well, it's easy for you to say this stuff about money. You're a, you're some good-looking white guy. And I was like, well, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> but I was like, how do you justify that? It's like everything has an equal disadvantage and advantage that it carries with it. Like, everything is a double-edged sword. Nothing exists as an absolute. Getting raised rich has advantages, just like it has disadvantages. Just like being poor can be one of the greatest motivators to become rich. Like, people say, well, I'm in a different, I'm unique. Everybody's unique. Everybody's got their own situation, their own battles, their own demons. So it's easy, like, hate never comes from above. Right. Yeah. And literally, well, it's it's hard to have hate from above if we're at 45,000. So astronauts can be looking down, but they're probably pretty happy. But they're probably doing what they love, so yeah, they're, they're, they're not hating. They're not concerned. It's yeah. actually kind of a funny thing, but it's like, you don't have people sitting up on a private jet making fun of some guy who's trying to make a go of it, who, like, by making ads. Like, we've, I've been running new ads this week, and you get, like, just some of these comments, like, you, oh, this ad wasn't, this ad wasn't relevant, but you need to quit what you're doing. And I'm like, really? Because it's making money, and... And then you always go, you click on their profile and it's like some guy with literally like 72 followers who's like really on. And you're like, okay, like I'm, that's your reality. And that doesn't have any, and even if they were well known or whatever, but you don't get that. Like you rarely get people further along than you who are gonna look back at you and be like, yo, fuck you. I'm gonna spew hate. It comes from below and you just, you stomach it and you become okay with it. Yeah, even like a funny example of this would be for um, video sales letters. So we're talking about sales videos that are, they can be any kind of length, but especially ones that are like 40 minutes, an hour long, and you're running them on Facebook through paid traffic and ads. Um, and I, I have a client right now where they're doing this and doing a ton of uh, volume, a ton of sales, and it's awesome. But I love reading the comments. And first of all, the guy, my friend Vince, who is in good shape, and it's either half the people are like, he's not even that good of shape, like, you know, fuck him. She's in crazy shape. The other half are like, he's on steroids, fuck him. Which he's actually not. He's not. And then there's like some people who are like, this is great, it really works. And then the other thing that's funny is like, I read the comments because I see ads for the thing I wrote and it's cool. Um, it's, it's fun to see creations of you done out on the road. But people, this is too long. You guys don't know anything. You guys clearly don't know anything about marketing. Why is this video so long? Why is it so long? And then, and, but they're, you know, they have experience. Got, Meanwhile, they're doing yeah, thousands of friends a day. At yeah. a high volume, I mean, their their company's a hundred twenty million dollar year plus company, um, and they grew fast. And it's like you can so I'm like all right, but it's so funny because this guy's perspective down here is kind of like these guys are idiots, they're dumb, they're making mistakes. Like I know better, but it's like why are you wasting all your energy on that? Like waste your energy on getting up or do what they're doing, you know? Like whatever yeah. it is, like. And I and I but I'll respond to the ads at least on Instagram because I see them. I'll respond to the comments now because at first it's fun for me. I like to like have a banter with it and have fun with it and then save them and then share them um but like a guy this morning is like oh you know this was a, you clearly don't know what you're doing and this is irrelevant and i didn't and i'm like it was so irrelevant that you took the time to respond to a yeah. comment i said that's a bit of a weird use of time and then there was a guy yesterday he goes this is a negative ad because said this it's about my book it says this is not a bestseller so why do you have to be negative and hating and i was like the ad says this is not a bestseller Every guru out there seems to have a bestseller that they have, you know, on, it's a, it's an Amazon bestseller that they game the algorithm and it's, you know, number one and they say it's a number one bestseller, but it's a sales book and it's in the category of underwater basket weaving. And for the most part, it's these comments of like, oh, I love this ad. This is great copy. This guy says it's negative. And I go, I understand that you, you know, that you think that I don't view it as negative. I actually acknowledge that some people have their books legit. I'm just calling out an industry. And he goes, Really, bro, a guy tell your audience tells you that your ad is negative, and then you say that you don't think it's negative. How does that matter? And I said, my audience didn't say it's negative. You did. That is your reality. Right. And I respect your reality. You're allowed to have opinions. They're not based on me. They're based on his own triggering to his past and all the feelings he's having. Most of the time, people are just sitting there because they're having a bad day, and they want to feel a little bit better by pulling me down, and I don't give a shit. It right. doesn't matter. It, does, it literally has nothing to do with my actions are my own and I'm not going to shift and I literally wrote all this stuff I go or on the comments I go I'm not going to shift my behavior to accommodate and appease one person who's unhappy the fact that he's having an emotional reaction actually means that it's probably a good ad because I'm getting a visceral reaction that's what's happening with these fitness yeah, ads totally. and you want that you want that visceral feeling 
where somebody hates it. Because if somebody hates it, somebody probably loves it. You don't want those ads that are completely boring. Yeah. What do you want an ad that has like no comments? Yeah. I mean, the worst ad that you kill that in a minute because like clearly you're not engaging, you're not striking a chord, like you know, you want that. You want that and emotional then, reaction? Yeah, 100%. I, you know, I think for me, my mindset, and it's taken me a while to get here, it really is like, um, how can I spend as much time per day doing only activities that I truly love to do, um, you know, being creative, and then turning things into like ROI generating activities, but yes, financially, but also again, a return of joy, happiness, fun, growth, um, you know, all those sorts of things. And like, that's how I look at it for like every single day. And I, I know, I guess it's like, I'm not trying to go on a segue there or randomly like off to the side, but like, that's going back to mindset. Like that's my mindset and it's serving me incredibly well. And I think Ian has that exact same mindset. Well, and I've seen your, we've known each other now for a few years where we both were the youngest, probably poorest people at the mastermind we were at in Paris. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right? I mean, and I, remember, I, I was there, and I, you know, I was 26, I guess, a few years ago. And I'm with like all these like people that 10 years ago, I had, or maybe seven, six, seven years ago, knew about through like their interviews with Tim Ferriss and like how much they were like the legends of the industry. And suddenly, I'm in a room with them in a chateau in Paris, like having this surreal racing go karts at Le Mans and an F1 track. Right. In going in wine caves and like and just and and like and it felt surreal and I felt very grateful but also I felt a little out of place at times and him and I were the youngest people there and he has you know like and then he had his own company and I had my own and then we've, we've both been growing separately but I've watched as stuff has changed for him and it's gone from us being copywriters trying to make it to then being business owners to then selling companies to then ending up in somehow, we didn't even know we were each gonna be in New York. Yeah, I, know I didn't know he was here until I literally batman him from behind. Um, that sounds weird. It's, yeah, it's and uh, gave him that phone or that fear phone. And so, but like, in, in watching, like what you just said about fun, joy and these things, I have this very weird thing where I have a direct correlation between the amount of fun I have and the amount of money I make. The more I have fun, the more money I make. And people go, well, that's crazy, that's weird. But I think it's more realistic for people than they think. But this is super fun to me. And then I made a lie topaz video on the web, and then I'm gonna make whatever other crazy shit comes to my mind. And oddly enough, those fun videos, they're not thought out, not structured, not written, just I'm gonna have a blast. Those things end up getting shared and they end up somehow leading people back to me. Like I've made, and this is weird, I want to get an article in like Forbes or Entrepreneur that's how I made over a million dollars from parody videos. Because these people watch these stupid parody videos that I make and then have gone into my business and ended up buying stuff and doing deeper emotional work and working on themselves and like, and so it's like, how odd of a life, I never could have imagined this, <laughs> right? That getting paid to make videos on a plane. So also people that complain about our era, our generation, it's insane. You have a phone, I have an iPhone in front of me that we can record videos and share them with the world. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you couldn't even, you'd have to get on TV for your message to get out there. You didn't have a, you'd have to buy a $10,000 camera that was the size of this plane. Like, we live in an incredible era where you can do anything. It sounds like a really preachy, like, but it's, it's, uplifting thing, but it's I really true. feel this way. Like, it's, it's surreal, but the, the growth, especially as you let go of the restrictions as they come up, and just really trust in the abundance. It's easier said than done, but if you can trust that the world is seriously printing money every single day, and that right now, this I'm gonna keep realizing, right now somebody wants to give you money. Yeah. Like literally, because I'll think of this, I'm like, oh, I'm probably gonna call that guy tomorrow and give him money for this thing, and he doesn't know that I'm thinking about it. And somebody right now is thinking about giving Stefan money. And then at some point they're going to send him the money, but right now somebody wants to give it to you. And the more you put yourself out there, the more likely they remember they want to give it to you. I actually think about that with like, even like getting emails or Skype messages, and especially from, yes, from people who want to give me money. Um, but in general, I actually have this weird kind of thought about this, which is like gratitude. Because like, how cool is that? Like I'm going about my day and I'm getting emails, Skype messages, calls, texts throughout the course of the day. 
she said throughout my day all these people were thinking about me yeah. and wanted to reach out to me they felt that I was you know I had enough to give or there was a reason that I could contribute to their life in some way that yeah. they you know reached out to me and did it so yeah I was like a thought in their mind before they reached out and I it sounds funny but I think we kind of just take that for granted and we assume like um you know all these interactions happen but when you think about it it's kind of profound and cool that there are people all over the place like all over the country right now thinking about you wanting to do stuff with you wanting to talk with you wanting to find out how you're doing and I think that's just a really really neat thing if you look at it from that perspective yeah and I think part of it too goes to the long game and uh and like to me probably the most valuable currency is trust and I've been building trust for years and years and even like what I said about the client thing I don't think of myself as this on this moral high horse of I'm a better person because I have these things I just know my comfort levels of what I'm willing to sell and not sell and over the years there are things that I could have done to make quick money and I didn't and I call it and this is super cheesy but I stepped over a lot of dollar bills to pick up pennies but those pennies have turned into five ten twenty hundred dollar bills at this point and that's over the course of years but trust has been my my highest like currency to me and what happens is when you put value out and you treat people well and you create fun stuff and you have a good time that that's part of the long tail of what you're even talking about of people thinking about Stefan or me right now I have this video about my dog that gets just crazy amounts of views and right now somebody is crying watching a video about my dog and I have no idea who that person is or how they may end up coming back into my life and if all they do is get value from watching that video then that's amazing but it's this long tail of like putting value out there without the expectation of having to get something because one of the biggest things is when you have an expectation and you set a goal of this amount I want to make this amount come back you're actually creating a lower limit what if instead of thinking how do I make 24,000 back from this jet right well, how do I make just exponentially more? Because if you limit yourself to a $24,000 repayment, well, what if it could have been 500000 Yeah. And you, you can measure what you, you know, even this is a really good quote I'd heard, is when people are stopping doing hourly work and stuff, they get these, like, emotional feelings. Like, well, I know I'm getting paid for this coaching or for this thing. And you can measure what you're going to lose, but you can't measure what you can gain. You don't know what that can turn into. And so it's that long tail of like trusting that I'm gonna do this and that it's gonna come back in some magnificent way. I had a really an interesting thought a minute ago, which was like, if you look at um, the one who has that book about the, the unexpected joy of tidying up or whatever. Mary Kondo. Mary Kondo. Like, so like, that gets so juice about your items in your house, right? And you're going through and you're looking at these items and all the things that don't bring you joy, you get rid of, you throw them out, you throw them out. But I'm like, why don't we talk about doing that in our life, like in our professional lives as, as entrepreneurs, um, right? Like, as you look at your day-to-day, -day, like, activities and the things that you're doing, like, because that's one thing I've done over the last Does year. Does this spark joy? Right? Does this spark joy? Do I feel happy from this? And the things that the answer is no, it's all about, you know, getting rid of them. And maybe it doesn't happen overnight, right? Maybe it's creating systems, delegating, uh, creating processes. Some of the times, so it's actually going to be as easy as cutting something. Like, you have eight clients you love and one client you hate. Get rid of that fucking client, like every time. There's yes. never a time. It's not worth it. Never a time where it's worth it. And your happiness will go so much higher and deeper, and you'll be more productive. You will always get a massive ROI from that. Uh, and I just think that that's sort of an interesting thing. Like, you look at that. Like, I mean, Ian was bringing this up to me earlier before we were filming. And by the way, with the filming, if you hear my daughter crying, she's up there with my wife. I'm not just like shooting this like <laughs> DJ, like video and ignoring my crying daughter. Like you call it a, a total So you know, you know that Stefan's been on a few private jets because I refer to it as a private jet and he calls it a PJ. Yeah. Because he doesn't have time to even mention, oh, I got a new Richard Manuel on yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, you definitely do. We also created a, an incredible uh, product while we were on here called the Entrepreneur Diaper. It's a working oh, title. You'll see that. But yeah, that'll be a video coming out. You know, look, are you tired of wasting time on the toilet? introducing what babies do it's called pooping your pants and it saves way more time so we're gonna make a nice little ad here on the on the pj it's gonna be excellent on the pj on the pj but like you know Ian was talking to me about how um like i guess like a year and a half ago when i weighed like probably 200 pounds which was very for me very heavy i'm about 165 right now um but the funniest thing i've noticed is that i've been as i go to conferences the last year it started at tnc not last year but the year before i remember ian actually was like wow you look 
good. You look healthy. You look really bad for a minute there. And I'm I, a pretty honest guy. Which is and I've known him friends. for a yeah, long time. I appreciated it. Um, that's eye opening. But even I was just up in Reno for uh, Tara Larson's event we went to, and uh, Rome Zah, a couple other people came up to me and said the same thing. And I didn't even realize it at the time. Um, but okay, I've lost like 35 pounds. I'm making more money than I've ever made. I'm uh, really relaxed all the time. And what have I done? I just cut out all the shit I didn't want to do. I mean, a massive amount of it. Again, over time. I, I, you gotta pay your bills, I understand but you're, that. you're working less than you used to. Oh yeah. And making way more. Yeah, definitely. And you are like, you look so much healthier and you're happier. Like, you're, he was in that like skinny fat, like traditional kind of entrepreneurial thing that happens when people get really into building their business, making money, they, they put their health on the back burner and they start, it's just slip, it's a slow little like boiling the frog. Yeah. You know, they just like, oh, well, okay, I'm at an event, we'll drink, and then I'll get back on it, and then, well, I'm going to work, and I'm going to put this behind, and then, which also then sometimes, like, and I, I mean, I don't necessarily need to go too far, but at times, like, people are in the health space, but they're out of shape. Yeah. And to me, that's very incongruent, and <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm not okay with it. For, I don't want to, you know, and this isn't about a fat shaming thing. Right. I'm not going to go to a fat personal trainer, just right. like I'm not going to go to a broke financial planner. Or why you wouldn't want to listen to me if I was, in fact, had no money. And I'm teaching you about money. That would be bullshit. Right. And so, but what happens is it actually creates a deeper layer of shame when you're writing about health products and you're not in shape. It starts to create a shame spiral and you feel worse and worse. And then when you can start to let go of that and treat yourself better and stuff, it's like, not only do you end up working less and making more and feeling better, but I think for me, like you said it, as well as like those joyous moments, those, those moments that spark, it's like Marie Kondo sparking joy. And she's also a person who, she wrote this book, it got some traction and people read it and then suddenly, after being really good at what she does for a while, made a leap into mass culture through a Netflix show. Yeah. Like, that's what can happen when you are really good at what you do and you treat your craft well and you treat people well. And so, but what I seek out are those moments without moments. It's the moments where time ceases to exist. We typically experience time in one of three ways. It's either we don't have enough of it and we're constantly fighting this battle against it, which is ironic because battle doesn't, or because time doesn't give a fuck about you. Time isn't real anyway. Time doesn't speak English. It can't be managed. It can't be, you know, and we're just trying to hold on to time and it just slips through our fingers the more we try and hold on. And then, or, or we're bored and we have so much time we don't know what to do with it and we can't find the right Netflix show or Hulu or whatever it is. And then there's this third little category where time slips away completely and we're not aware of it and we just are and we just exist. And you can call it flow, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but there are these moments without moments where there's no concept of seconds or minutes or hours. Even when we're recording this, I can technically look in the middle and it says 37 minutes. But I've had no awareness at the time because yeah. this is so enjoyable. Totally. And, and the other thing is, the more you spend time in those flowing moments, you tend to make way more per minute in those states. Yeah. So by letting go of this attachment to doing these shitty things and all this stuff, there are parts in your career where you may do some stuff you don't want to do. Sure. You have to be okay with it for third time. But if you make your life doing what you don't want to do, it's a very miserable existence and you can start to hire other people you know, I just think it's, people get very caught in the trap of, I'm going to just, well, whatever, I'm just going to power through this, and I hate this, but it's funny. Yeah, we had a guy, for I own a, a call center, it's one of my businesses, and one of our, our guys... <laughs> nothing, nothing like wearing this jacket on a private jet, it's I own a call center. Dude, my call center is great, though. It's, it's, no, and I know you... I know. Yeah, I agree with you. Say, but you know, culturally, actually, is I'm very proud of it. People like working there. Um, it's not like cold call, like tele no, no, it's telemarketer. Not like, it's, not it's like they do back end customer, like customer service, service. Yeah. and like stuff for companies. Ecom, like e com companies, you know, have like a number, want to put a number on their website to, you know, the consumers have questions about the products, stuff like that. Um, it's actually been, it's great from like, there's entrepreneurial lessons we learned there because I, I honestly spend an hour every two weeks on the call center. Um, and it's, the revenue's doubled every year for the last couple of years, and it, it's going great. It's awesome. So it's awesome. I'm very proud of that. Um, but like, I had a whole point about it. Don't know what the point was. It was a great point, though. Um, call center. Right. 
Turtle Peak. Right before, right Turtle before. Peak. Yes. Turtle Peak, go check Turtle it Peak, out. Yeah, TurtlePeakCS.com. Um, Boom. But I got a really profound point. It'll probably come back to It'll me. It'll come back. I trust it. Yeah. As I interrupted you rudely. No, it's okay. Uh, actually, I think that's one of the interesting things is we all make our own assumptions about what people think about things. Like, right. call center has a can have a negative connotation. Very often, yeah. But you can actually go in and, and go into an industry and actually be a good person within the industry and do really well because of it. And instead of taking going into even like that's what Uber did. They said, well, what's really terrible about cabs? Well, most things, except that it gets you where you need to go. So what if we could get people where they needed to go, but they could tap this and they didn't have to talk to some guy who didn't speak their language and it didn't smell like Body meatball and, sandwiches. Yeah. And, you know, well, that can't be a good smell. Um, but like, they took out all the bad. They, but you could have said, well, the taxi industry is, it's monopolized and it's not something we can make succeed. And, you know, it's like, it's sort of got a bad feeling about it. And instead they said, well, what if we do something different? What if we make it not that way? So I think that's an interesting thing in itself, of like yeah. viewing things from a different perspective of what you may perceive them as. I absolutely, yeah, I think so. I, you know, innovation gets like thrown around. Disrupt. Probably, disrupt, innovate, you know, just, yeah. Um, but improvements, incremental improvements are in the, their own way, like just as beautiful and glorious and needle movie. And so you don't have to redo everything. You just take something that already exists and you just improve upon it. Um, whether that's like a call center, they create like a great environment for people to work in, and you know, hire, I mean, like, I've had people, even like a former executive of, uh, of that call center was like, what if we do, like, we'll open one in this, like, you know, third world country, and then we can also, you know, service other people who don't want to, like, um, you know, don't, don't want to pay as much for, they don't care as much. I'm like, no, that would be completely an antithetical to what we're trying to do. Like, we have a very, very, simple focus core which is like basically high-end premium customer experiences you know for clients and like i think but that was kind of missing and on the e-com side honestly like there's a lot of guys who are doing shopify stores building what they hope to be like successful brands and they aren't doing customer service at all because they were born on the internet they started like a shopify they started drop shipping now they're not drop shipping uh but they're just not doing so there's this huge like blue ocean for us yeah. um but nobody really tackled that before they went to like dead and like shady kind of like telemarketing or they went to like very aggressive fly by night like neutral offers for like dick pills um and like nobody thought to like we're gonna circle under. back to what we talked about before. oh i can't look up your little sheet on the phone but we had some stuff we were maybe gonna we did we had like three bullet points we might cover which one of them is oh you know from uh i mean i guess from from dick pills to like compliant. Everyone my my phrasing on it was, but it was from selling like Jesus dick pills to right. that sounds so bad out of context. It does to, to doing compliant stuff, but well, it's just, what evolution, I guess, right? Yeah, it's, it's been an evolution. interesting journey just watching this stuff of like what you think. You went from basically writing for other people, selling an insane like hundreds of millions of dollars of the products for them, and writing like a sales letter every week, one or two a week. And like, and we actually had this sort of odd, almost similar path in ways where I was doing about one every two weeks, we were building a full new funnel at the company I was with. And so I got this massive growth span in a very short period of time. But here's one thing I want to say for anybody who is, and this I think applies to any industry and anything you're doing, but if you are a copywriter and a freelancer in any way, is these people, you write for someone and then they don't give you any feedback on what actually happened. They go, oh, I liked it. Right. But they don't tell you how it actually performed. And the way that I equate this is like, it's like playing tennis, except there's a big screen over the middle and you can't see where the ball's going. So you're hitting and you're like, well, that felt good. It's like, well, that hit the fence. <laughs> and you have no idea. And so I had the luxury, and I think you had this too, when I wrote a sales letter or a VSL or I got on, and I started getting on camera, I got feedback and data, so I knew what worked. Right. And so I could then recreate templates and formulas based on that. Most freelancers and stuff, and a lot of people do this in their jobs in general, they don't focus on getting data and feedback from what they're doing. Right. So I'm so distracting some. Uh, no, I, I actually have to pee. And yeah, I'm gonna get, another, I'm gonna get another McCallum. It's time to have a snack. It's cool watching, and then Laura's reading my book, and I can see she's on like chapter three time and money are not related. And we just talked about that. 
Yeah. Whee, there I'll we go. The too, though, yeah, you gotta show the cup. Oh, it's, it's really, really uh, good. Are you so enjoying far. it so yeah, far? Yeah, it's like really entertaining and I'm learning a ton. Yeah. yeah. Did you read the All lemonade right. story just yeah, now? Yeah, That's it. my favorite story. Sorry, he's a restaurant. Sorry. Sorry. All right, we'll be back. Okay, we're back. We've spent the last little bit, uh, well, I made a Can't Go Down video. Yeah. Pop my collars. Oh, I should have three button. That looks weird. Now it's like, why is it shut up? But we've been dealing with attempting to get Stefan's child to sleep. Did not, did not, not successful. No. She's but watching Moana now. She's loving that. So that's good. Um, and then uh, we talked about some other things and stuff and had fun. And uh, now we are going to. We actually had some great conversations with one of our pilots. Yeah, which may make it into like a uh, bonus module. And if it's know? if it's included in here, then I apologize for re-saying this. But so he flew for Emirates, which is pretty fascinating because Emirates has the most insane flights. He's like, yeah, there's not much like taking a shower at thirty-seven thousand feet, and like they have suites and they have all stuff. Right. And he said that uh, Stefan was saying there's some photo online of some like Saudi guy or something with a hundred falcons on a plane, like a literal that many. And the pilot is telling us that on Emirates, they have a two falcon rule. So each person can have two falcons. Is that not the most absurd no. rule? Like, there's a two falcon, that's not a thing. That's the only, that's the type of thing you only learn on a private jet. True. I that's swear, there's no, I've never been out at a bar and a guy's like, yeah man, like I only fly Emirates cause you know, I have my two Falcons, and everywhere else they have a one Falcon rule, and I need both my Falcons to come with me on a plane. But what's really important for you guys to know, because you may be hearing that and being like, fuck, I was planning on flying on Emirates, but I have, you know, eight Falcons, I'm screwed. But you aren't. So the good news is, if you do have more than two Falcons, you can actually buy individual first class seats for your Falcons, for your Falcons which makes sense because they're probably depending on the flight, maybe $8,000 to $25,000 per about seat. 20, 000, so from like Dubai to LA is about 20,000 round trip first class. These people are paying $20,000 for a bird. And I don't mean a bird like a woman. <laughs> I mean like a literal falcon talent bird. Yeah. Which is remarkable. And honestly, that's the level of wealth I aspire to achieve is I just want to be able to buy my falcon. I want to get falcons first off. And then I want to be able to fly with my Falcons. Can you just imagine, like, you're sitting there, you're ready to go on this trip, but you have to select and pick which of your Falcons are coming and which aren't? I mean, what kind of awful life is that? And you're like, man, I wish that I had read, you know, Ian's book. I wish I had listened to Stefan and, and used his copy skills. Because that would, that would be the situation where now yeah, I'm... Yeah, now I have to pick which Falcon. And I'm sure each Falcon has different attributes. I'm sure, you know, one Falcon's a great conversationalist. One Falcon's really, you know, attractive and... A lot of attention. And, just, and one of the Falcons is just a great Falcon time. Right. There's yeah. definitely one Falcon that's an asshole, and you're like, that's fine. We know that Falcon's not coming. No problem. But of all these other Falcons I like, yeah. you know? It's a tough thing, you know, and you're thinking, oh, I could have given this $20,000 to something valuable, but instead I flew my Falcon uh, on a round trip. Right. Like, what Hopefully you, round trip. How much are you with using you. your Falcons that you need them in the location you're going? Like, is, it's not an emotional, is it an emotional support Falcon? Is it a service falcon yeah like, that's a great question i mean so if you're traveling with like a hundred falcons why <laughs> it's like <laughs> well what was the cutoff too like well it's gonna bring 96 but i realized without those four extra falcons life was just was gonna struggle yeah i thought about this okay this is real for marketing uh like direct mail is making a comeback in my belief because it's one of the few places where there's a tangible feeling anymore of marketing. Because if you send somebody direct mail, like a letter, a package, an envelope, they have an emotional reaction to opening it and this stuff. And so I think it's circling back around where direct mail is becoming more effective again. But what I was thinking is carrier pigeons. Yeah. Somebody made a joke to me and then I was like, wait, if I actually sent a carrier pigeon to someone, they would buy whatever I was selling because they'd be like, what the hell is this? Didn't like the government or the navy test like, using dolphins and whales to like bring secret codes? I'm pretty sure. So I think, you know, carrier pigeons are good, but if you have friends who are coastal, <laughs> a dolphin just kind of pops up like, you know, maybe like a pre-recorded announcement comes out. A dolphin gram. Yeah, a dolphin gram. I've been sending dolphin grams lately and yeah. they are just, it's my conversion rate is 100% on It really, it on really my cuts through the noise. It really does. Well, actually, so speaking of good questions like, how many falcons is too many falcons? Right. Um, 
Stefan and I were just talking about speed and how both of us tend to move very quickly with our businesses and with our copy and with the things that we do. And there's an old saying that's uh, money's attracted to speed, which I actually don't believe anymore. I think money is attracted to pace because it's speed times velocity. Velocity is speed in a given direction. And you can just move fast, but end up in the same place because you're just moving fast in direction, different directions. Velocity is choosing a direction and moving fast, but at a sustainable pace. Like that's the pace part, right? Money is attracted to pace. And so, um, but both of us move very quickly with what we do, and even with what we talked about already with this freelancer, I've heard this freelancer freedom, maybe, or maybe freelancer fest. Right. That's pretty, uh, yeah. maybe, I don't know. Um, but with that, the way we're looking at it is from a very fast perspective of like, because people go, oh, well, how do we help them? What is the product? What is this? No, no, no. We sell the seats, then we create the content, and then we repurpose the content and sell it over and over. That's a very fast process, whereas people are like, they spend so much time waiting and thinking. And we have the advantage of having run a lot of different stuff, sure. but that's what I'm curious is what do you think it is that separates why are we fast? We don't know the answer to this. This is us just. Yeah, no, we actually, Ian asked that. We sort of started thinking about it and we're like, let's not even, we don't even have an answer. Let's just actually start recording and think about it, like on camera and on film. And you know, the one thing I'll say right away is it's definitely, being fast is great. Um, if there's intentionality and you're fast about the right thing. So I do want to kind of do that caveat or preface because earlier on in my career, I made mistakes where I'd say yes to too many things, jump in, try to go fast, but that actually ends up wasting a ton of your time because you're going to the wrong things and then you do too many things. So it's not a matter of like, now I'm gonna say yes to everything and do it fast. You're still saying no to like 99% of the things that come across your desk or you know that are, you're presented with as opportunities. But it's when you do, commit to something, there's a higher probably um, bar for committing to something, but when you do commit, that's when you go fast. And I think, you know, for me, thinking to get completely off the cuff here, it's, I think like, I start with the end of mind, okay, what's the end result? What's the end outcome? What do I want? Okay, I want this thing. This is where I want to go to. I'm here, okay? And I work backwards. I truly do do this. I, I teach this. All right, what steps are required to get to this? Well, I'm going to need this, 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 this. Great. Okay, for each of those steps, how long will it take to get to each of those little steps? How much of my time is involved? How much can I delegate or how much can I give to somebody else? What are their, their costs involved? What are the costs gonna be? And like, what is in the fastest route for me to get from here to my end goal? But I start at the end goal and then I work backwards and then once I have it all intellectually here, then I actually start down here and come back up this way. And that's sort of like a very, on a conceptual level, how I approach it. I'm not sure if you are similar no, or how you feel. I think I, I personally will think of the very long term and then I don't share that with anyone. That's kind of for me, is what is the big vision? And I've been trying to get better at this with my employees of like sharing the vision, but there are times where I like to keep stuff just as like the big vision, but the end goal itself of the thing, like I think it partially comes down to, like one of the things that I've been asked is, well how do you know if an offer is gonna work? because they typically do the ones that I'll create. And I'll say there's a mix between either having asked my audience or just a gut thing. And that's the harder thing to like have be tangible. But I think both of us have seen so many offers in so many spaces from, for me, you know, credit repair to survival, to health, to supplements, to fat loss, to muscle gain, to all the, to, you know, making money online, to all these different spaces. So you start to see what do people want? And then within a space, where like I've had this audience for years, and, you know, for a few years now, I know that clients is a big pain point. So I know when suddenly we're like introvert, extrovert system, well, that's gonna work. Right. And we both know that we can write whatever's gonna create it or make a video that's gonna sell that thing. So I'd say that I'd be given with the end in mind, uh, it's not what do I wanna teach? What do I wanna put out there? It's what do people need? What do they want and how can I give them what they need around their desire? Right. So I would say it's very end focused. Yeah. Um, and it's building back. It's like even uh, Stephen Pressfield, his book, Turning Pro and then uh, The War of Art and in his book called Do the Work, which is the first little book I ever wrote, I read Do the Work and then I sat down and did it. 
and he says the perfect outline for anything is one yellow page of full scrap paper. Right. And if you're trying to write the three act structure, you just fit your three act structure onto this piece of paper. And that can be for an author, for a business, for a screenplay, for a book. And you can fit it on this yellow piece of paper, but you start with the end. And you write, how do you want them to feel at the end? What is the end of it? And then work backward to the start. So you can literally lay it out on one piece of paper. What is the end result? What are we looking for? What's the act three? And then move up to the other acts from there. I think another tremendously important uh, aspect of moving fast is modeling and looking at what's already working and like a, a similar space, similar vertical, whatever it is you're doing. Find an example of like what's working and then they like, model off of that. I, that's the thing for me. I think there's very few things that I could like launch from like an offer or a, a business perspective that I wouldn't feel confident in, but it's not because I'm this genius who is able to, based That's on my IQ plug. test, I like, mean, really not, like, we're not sure. I, I did a, a drunken IQ test recently. He did a drunk IQ test did, and it was go lower great. than he expected. Yes. Um, but I think it's gonna be higher when he... Well, yeah, I'm gonna try sober soon. I'll, I'll give you guys an update on that. Um, but, but truly, um, it's modeling. It's Maybe modeling. we need two IQs, a sober IQ and a drunk IQ. Yeah, what's your, they have to Maybe emotional. some people don't change that. about like EQ, EQ, IQ, IQ, D, now, DQ, DQ, yeah. Not, not Derek Queen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, no, but seriously, like, hey, yo, who's done this? What it look like? Model off of them. It doesn't mean you just copy and paste it and you steal their stuff. You can still, you know, I see this, you know, copywriting guys who try to do an offer for something that I've seen or done multiple successful versions of. But then instead of modeling off that, they, they basically just try to do wildly unique and innovative things. And while innovation, again, is great, you don't need to innovate. You can just sort of like improve. You can model, you can copy. And so that's the way to do things a lot faster. You don't, this whole idea of, oh, I've never done it before, or I don't know what to do, is to me really like a self limiting excuse because other people have done, the way it has been paved, you're never reinventing the wheel. I put like, I put a post up on one of my Facebook groups recently about, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, it's a lot easier to like, you know, have a beer with the inventor of the wheel and be like, hey, how do you do it? Um, right, but yeah. it doesn't have to be in person. You could also just like get the blueprints of the wheel, read the step-by-step -step instructions, and be like, oh, okay, I'll just do that then. Yeah, to me it's more, I'll typically take the wheel and I just want to make it spin faster. Right. I don't even want to talk to the guy who made it. I'm just like, let me just kick this fucker in. But I think that's actually a very good analogy too. It's like, how'd you do it? I want to make one. Right. Not let me just try and look at it and piece it together. Yeah. The other thing that I'll do, similar to modeling, and I want to say about modeling, modeling is a guaranteed way to make some money. Yes. And if you want to make a ton of money or no money, you try to disrupt some massive space. And that's why you hear about Uber, but you don't hear about this 50 companies that bombed at what the, well, I'm on a plane, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, <laughs> but like, you shouldn't, disrupting and being innovative and all these things, it's, it's a great concept, it's great, but a lot of the times people fail. If you really think you have something innovative, do it, but when it comes to copy or it comes to these things where people have proven templates and stuff, go use those. And, and so what I do from the modeling perspective too is, instead of just taking from the space I'm writing in, so let's say I'm writing about uh, health. And what I'll do is you go and you read a golf sales letter, and then you take the structure of the golf sales letter, and then you fit the health letter into the golf structure. So you take what's working in this other space, right. and then you replicate it, because then there's also no wondering about stealing or swiping or things where it's like, it's very clear that you just took the concepts from a different space, and that's just sometimes, you'll meet a guy who does construction and you'll get an idea for your online business that you never would have imagined because you went outside that expected realm. That's another, re I, so, and I do enjoy reading. Um, some people get their knowledge from knowledge, from, uh, knowledge better than from knowledge. YouTube or other things like that. Um, but what I read, I actually don't read that many business books. I read a lot of nonfiction. I read, I know, yikes. I read nonfiction, I read biographies. I, read <laughs> I wasn't the only what you said. I think I'm making a, oh no, he doesn't read business books, but in a facetious way, I thought. No, I needed um, oxygen in my brain, that's right, all that. Right, that makes sense too. But you know what I mean? I actually love reading and getting ideas of, of books about totally random things. Um, and some of my best ideas come from that. Uh, but you know, back to Uber, one kind of interesting thing to think about is like, yes, they did disrupt and like they, they absolutely disrupted. They disrupted a massive, massive, massive industry. But look at it, okay, how'd they do it? Apps, were, were apps a new thing? No, apps existed. GPS, like tracking GPS locations? No, totally new. Ability to text or communicate with like a, you know, person like through the phone, I mean like communicate with your driver. Yeah. A five-star rating system that then, you know, incentivizes people 
to you know do a better job because yeah. there's like a dual feedback system not new right the nuts and bolts of it these things all already existed That's all true, they yeah. did was take this existing technology oh, no, no. and apply it to a different space and that was the disrupt it was the idea it was a disruptive genius idea the the implementation of the technology while they have great technology behind them that wasn't like they didn't reinvent the technology because why the fuck would you they had their own maps actually they did they, they had to use their own maps now but originally they would use like google maps and stuff like that and then google eventually kicked them off and i'm not sure what they're doing now but even the maps that they use the gps stuff it wasn't like they didn't create their own they, gps they system. leveraged existing winning technology yeah. to build one right. that was massive and i look at a sales letter same thing right okay like this is a great emotional lead this is a great way of presenting the offer. This is a great way of building value. This is a great way of closing. Taking this, again, go to a different vertical, sure. Find like a, you know, survival offer, but they still have principles that are gonna apply to what you're doing for help. You know, same thing for Facebook, you know, for media buying, ad buying, stuff like that, okay? These ads are working over here for a greens juice. I'm selling this gadget, but they're doing this structure. Take and apply it. And so, again, by doing that, you just eliminate so many of these like hurdles in your mind, I feel. Um, but I, and I do agree ultimately though, that the most valuable things are the disruptive things because you're capturing a huge market. Um, it, it's just a special opportunity, but yeah. But again, it's like, especially the, uh, like I think there's a progression in your career is starting out, play it safer and follow proven methods and then start to innovate based on your own experience and stuff. For people that are starting out, they're like, I'm gonna disrupt an industry. And you're like, well, probably not. You're probably just gonna disrupt your bank account and lose. And I'm not trying to be discouraging, but it's like, when you get to a certain point, you grin, you're, you're innovating based on a foundation of understanding. That's a different level of innovation. Right. It's disrupting with previous knowledge. It's not just jumping in. But then for every person to say that about, there could be some guy jumps in first try and fucking smashes something, so. But I think, you know, yeah, and I think experience is, is invaluable and having experience, and sure. Some people will just come in, hit a unicorn, kill it, and that's awesome. It truly is awesome. Uh, I know for me, like, again, I, through all my failures, through all of the things that didn't work out, through all of the terrible mistakes I made, I made crazy, expensive, terrible mistakes. I love that. I'm so thankful for all of those things. Um, but it, as a point in case, my first business ever, I don't really even talk with Ian about this much, was like a, a record label in a music company. I don't know if you knew that or not. I, I was like I 19. My friend had a record label. I. I dropped out of college after a semester. I was working in a movie theater, you know, Friday night, making popcorn, the hot oil sitting me on the face, and I'm seeing kids my age on dates, you know, um, out living their lives, and I'm working in this movie theater, being paid seven twenty-five an hour, uh, having just dropped out of college after a semester, smoking weed all the time, super depressed, uh, going home after getting off, buying, using my paycheck to buy weed to play, get how I play Halo with my friend. And I was like, kind of depressed, but my friend had this record label, I love music, I went on the band's warp tour with him for like about a month of, out of the summer and I got so now like I want to do this I'm so excited and I did I got involved with it and ended up uh, like getting some equity in it and then he and I went out and actually raised some money I like Ian I know it's getting oxygen but I'm literally not it's really bored in any way um, it has nothing to do with you it's literally my brain trying to grab oxygen here, here's the thing we're so right? high in the head yeah here's what we ended up doing we had a retail we had a record store inside a music venue which was a sort of good idea. This is like internet music existed, but not Spotify or anything yet. Um, we had a record label. Then we ran, then we licensed with these guys to do a recording studio in San Diego. They had a successful uh, like few recording studios that were in uh, the Riverside, LA area. So we basically raised money to build a recording studio in San Diego. Then these guys were like, oh yeah, hey, we do screen printing and stuff. We're like, oh, come on, do it through us. These guys wanted to do a hip hop label. We said, like, come on, do it through us. We did concert promotion. And if you're not, guess what happened? I would guess you could say is uh, we failed spectacularly. We had, uh, you know, I lost money. I lost other people's money, which be very which young, is hard. very hard. Um, and we failed. And I'm kind of down. And then there's a lesson there in that there was a period of time where I feel like I was gonna be stuck in it forever when I was like 20 years old. And I'm like, you know, six months later, moved off my life and everything went on. So there's a lesson there in that I, I, a lot of times like things. No matter how bad things seem, like the whole this too shall pass thing is a cliche, but it's true. These things do pass. Um, but the biggest lesson I learned probably from that was that we tried to do way too many things, right? We said yes to everything, we tried to do way too many things. The constant promotion stuff was fascinating to me. In hindsight now, as a businessman, if I were going to do one of the, one thing, it would be the constant promotion stuff. Because we had these- promotion? Concert promotion. What's that? So you'd have like um, local bands 
you have a venue. The venue costs two thousand dollars to rent out for the night. Okay, you get like five local bands, and you're like, all right, this guy maybe holds five hundred people. These guys can bring in twenty people. These guys can bring in fifty people. These guys can bring in a hundred people. These guys can bring in three hundred people. That's great. So if really you have five hundred people, you're like, if I, you know, concert tickets have to cost. They're really like a thousand dollars to run the venue. Let's say so thousand dollars. 500 people, so if we do $20 a ticket, that's $1,000. We paid for the rental of the venue. We can do $25 per ticket, great. Now we made like, you know, a little bit of money and so forth. But when we did those, we would actually make money like every time. But we'd only do them every now and then. And I even did some on my own at the end and would make money from doing it. But instead of focusing on that, where we could have started doing, you know, 10, 20 concerts a month and making $1,000 per concert and been 20 years old, making $20,000, $30,000 a month. And then from right. there, you know, done bigger promotions expanded. We tried to do seven other things at the same time. And so the lesson learned from that was just this power of focus, focusing on one thing, not trying to do too much, not trying to say yes to everything. Uh, but without that lesson, I wouldn't, I learned it for later in life though, and it helped me to avoid that same mistake. Well, I think even that, like, and I talk about this in my book. I've heard it's a good book. Yeah, your, your wife's reading it My wife's right actually now. devouring it. She, yeah, like, she has like, put it down. She's, she's been on the plane, she's like halfway through it already. Um, which actually will, I'm gonna read a section to you, she just found the section, she said you should, talk about this from the freelance stuff but uh i've recently had a re sort of awakening of my focus level and have zeroed in on doing these webinars for this one hour workday product i have and so my barometer became is, is now on thursday afternoon do i have a webinar scheduled that is my one key metric if i'm doing that i'm gonna make it at least just from that at least 10 to 20 grand each week that i'm doing it so preferably every week like that becomes a nice barometer what I'm supposed to be doing, but it's very focused because what I normally do is I go, well, what if I get three funnels working? Well, just get one because I'll get one working and then I jump and I go to move to something else. And so technically the two things, we have the, we have the book funnel and then we have the one hour work day, but I'm zeroed in on these things. And after Lionheart made the business, after we had decided to close that down, I made a choice to not take on any new businesses because I know my propensity to take on new stuff to distract myself. And I talk about in the book, it's like deciding on copy. That was gonna be my weapon. I'm gonna get good at copy. And then I got good at other stuff. But if you're in a, especially if you're early phases, get good at one thing. And that's Stefan looking yeah. at his baby who's yeah, sorry, starting she, to cry. Yeah, she fell asleep for a minute. I don't got She's a little sad, but I think we're gonna go on and go on again and see if we can recreate yeah, we'll, that. Yeah, okay. We'll finish this thought, take a little break, bring it back. Yeah. Basically, if you pick one thing, you're far more likely to succeed. And it's the same thing, like I say this about coaches, and I don't care if somebody just bought a product from somebody else, I'll still say to them, follow one coach, one product, one influencer person for 90 days, give them a shot, follow their program, stop jumping. So like when people buy my products, I say follow it for 90 days, you're gonna get results if you do it. But if they've just bought somebody else, that wait, yeah. just follow through. Okay, so going back to not just picking one thing, but on top of that, yeah, picking something manageable, right? Like for me, concept promotion stuff was actually very simple math, very manageable early on. But going back to like writing a sales letter or you know doing a set of Facebook ads for a client, whatever it is. I mean, it's an analogy I'm making up on the spot, but like if you're an architect and you're like, I'm gonna start out by being an architect, great. And you're like, I'm gonna build skyscrapers, the tallest skyscrapers the world has ever seen. Like you just fucked yourself for no reason. I and mean, maybe you'll get lucky and you'll do a great design. Someone will hire you to build like a hundred million dollar skyscraper or a billion dollar skyscraper probably you're gonna fuck up and fail. And that's how it should be. But if you're like, I'm gonna build like a modest, like one story house or like a one, uh, you know what I mean? By start small, get foundationally, and then just do what, what's in your realm of that. And then keep expanding from there and become more ambitious. Like ambition has a horizon, has a time span. And like, I think your ambition can be, you can have this ambition over here, but you don't start over here. You start here and you kind of slowly over the horizon, get to where your more ambitious goals and plans are. And so as you're starting out, or even, you know, you're doing some client work and you want to do more, like you just sort of take it modularly versus trying to jump, make these quantum leaps. You, they can happen, but they don't really go, you don't go from zero to 100. You, you go from 60 to 100 really fast. Yeah. But to go from zero to 60 that, or zero to 100 That's really a great hard. analogy. Yeah. yeah. Is, I think it's building the foundation. Build, build a foundational skill. So yeah. Skill is an asset in itself. Build a foundational skill and then develop upon that. Oh, she's still crying. So we yeah, can, we can maybe keep going instead of I doubt it. My shoulder boulders are getting a little fatigued That's, there. Yeah, one thing, um, Dan Locke, who's in like the, you know, I guess, kind of business space. Business, yeah. yeah, one of his, his copywriters is in my mastermind and- um, Which one? Henry. 
he doesn't know his Facebook ads and he kind of is in cheap of acquisition or something like that. Um, but Dan starts seeing a lot of Dan's copy because of I mean my mastermind. But Dan does that. He teaches these like sort of money making skills and there's maybe like six or eight of them. And so the idea is like you pick one at a time and you get really good at it and then you can go to another one. So one of them is copywriting, one of them is like closing or phone sales or whatever. One of them is whatever it is. And I actually really appreciate that that Dan teaches that. I think that's a very good yeah. way to approach that. We've been started with copy and then I've done phone sales after you've been a copywriter, if you like talking to people. Yeah. Phone sales is the easiest thing in the world. Easiest thing in the world. It's like cheating. It's like, oh, I've been writing the sales letter for a million different people, literally a million people to watch. And I've got to try and convert as many as I can. On a phone, you get to talk to one person about their problems. It's like unfair. You're yeah. like, oh, I'm just going to treat you like a person, find yeah. out your pain points, connect with you, and ask you a question if you object about your future, and then you're going to buy it. Yeah, I agree with that. So, I, I used to hate phone sales and stuff like that, and now like I love it. I don't do that often, but... Um, from a, a, a purely guarding my time perspective, I don't get on the phone a ton. But when but I do, when you do for time, it's so valuable. Oh, it's feedback. Great. Yeah, I love it, and I provide value. And I mean, I will. Be sh if I get on the phone for quite as well, I'm like, they're at the place where I think they're actually gonna hire me, right? I don't. Guy who's sort of like half interested, and I don't know anything about them. I'm not gonna spend my time on that. I think there's actually some value to that too. But by the time I get on the phone with a, a guy who He's a good fit, I'm a good fit, I'm gonna close him like every time. And it's not like an arrogant, cocky, like, I'm a closer. It's just like I know how to fucking sell. I don't like the whole closer. I know, and I know, but totally. No, but it, but there is a bad, like, to closing, like, you just part of it. need to close. So I'm looking at this uh, incredible book. Um, why don't we, do we want to let it? Now she's sucking her thumb. She's a bold as a little child. Yeah. As children are, as they should be. One of the it's things I you can't control her emotions. Oh man, which they're not supposed to. They're children. Yeah. Um, I know you know. Okay. Um, one of the things for like I have this thing. It's identifying your click moments. Is to call your customers, even if you are the CEO. No matter what it is, spend even if it's one hour a month grabbing, like getting on some phone calls. You will learn stuff. And it doesn't matter if you have a tech business, a copy business, whatever it is. Learn about your customers, your prospects. Find out their objections. The cool thing about calling prospects is you get paid because you close them on stuff and you get paid to learn. Yeah. So why don't we, we'll, we're going to take a quick little break and then when we come back, I feel like we have like a TV show right now, which it is is too. I mean, down. We'll talk about, if, if we if we can, we're going to, I want to talk about the math because you are the only other person I know who so deeply talks about the math for selling. And then I'll tell these five things for the freelance thing. Hello again, party people. We are almost ready to land. We've got 21 minutes left in our flight. And we just wanted to give you the final piece of what we had talked about, about the piece from this book, and then about doing the math. And we brought in a, um, this is a guest expert who is an expert in pants pooping and crying on planes. So Eden, what do you think about doing the math when you're getting a new client? Asking you're gonna hold the yeah. secrets in. You're just gonna. You're on. You're on. We specifically told people you're gonna be here, and you're just gonna look away. Oh, is it? Oh, Aztecs. I'm, is not, that what you just I'm said? not just her father. I'm her agent, and she does not give free advice. Okay. Let's talk about the math. We don't have to go too far because we don't have too much time yeah. right now. But I want you to start out with that because I think it's the one. I've not seen anybody else do it as well as you do it. And you pitched me on the phone yesterday, like he fake pitched me, and I was like, I would buy that. Because he just did the math very well. And that's one of the rules, I think chapter six in this is do the math. Yeah. So I'd like for you to talk about your one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the way I do it, you give you an example, would be, I charge $50,000 to write a sales letter for somebody. Oh wow, that's a lot of money. Sure. Um, I charge way, 25, which I thought was a lot now. I charge, I honestly don't know of any writers who charge more than me. Um, which is kind of cool, in a way. Uh, yeah. But like the way I do it is, is like, and I do the math for them. So if I'm talking to a client, let's say it's a health supplement offer. And I'm like, all right, like what your profit margin on this, and I've, I've run these offers so I know, it should be like 20%, right? Sure, cool. If you're hiring me, you should want to do at least a million dollars in revenue. If you don't want to do at least a million dollars in revenue with this offer, you shouldn't hire me. I'm not the right fit for you. But if you do, okay, great. At 20% profit margin, that means you're going to net $200,000. You're paying me $50,000 
So we get a high probability of that happening. It's not guaranteed, it's not certain, we can talk about other things there. A high probability of that happening. So basically you're expecting a 4X ROI on your investment of $50,000. But really, let's be honest, if you're really hiring me and the caliber of client that I want to be working with and I'm the caliber of writer that you want to be working with, you really want to do like probably $10 million with this. And this isn't like, you know, bullshit adding up the numbers, it's true. No, like, it's office do that the, the big guys are doing that and like stuff. So great, $10 million, 20% profit margin, $2 million. So what does that mean? You can be $50,000, then your ROI on the $50,000 is a 40X ROI. And that's before you even get to like the list monetization, data monetization, back-end. customer service, backend, all of that. And so that's why you're hiring me is because you're having a, a good probability, a good chance of hitting an ROI of between 4X and 40X. And if I'm giving you that opportunity, or every time you give me a dollar, I give you back $4 or $40, you should, unless if you have the money, and if we're talking, you should have the money, then it's always, almost always going to make sense for you to hire me to do that project. And right. so that's the math I do. And he's not pitching that to a six-figure business owner. No. But the reality is, like, people don't do that. They don't go, so one of, one of the things I say is I say, and I I wrote this in, it's in here in the chat, and Laura, who's Stefan's wife, was, she was like, hey, I've been reading the book, and this sentence would help with what you're talking about. But basically, and I don't, I guess I don't necessarily need to look, but basically what I do is I say, if if I give you, if you give me, you know, $20,000 and I gave you back $200,000 in three months, is that a deal you would do? And every, oh well, yeah, of course. Well, that's actually what I'm offering you, except it's probably gonna be a lot more. And so what Stefan said though is, you wanna say the specific pieces of 4X, right. 40X, you want to, you have to do every layer of math. People think that they don't wanna, they don't wanna do the math. Here's the thing, no consumer, or even a client wants to do the math. People aren't naturally intrigued to do math. So when he says $50,000 with a return of 200,000, that's 4X. You do not stop it with a return of 200,000 because in their mind, all they heard was 50 and 200. They did not hear a four times ROI. And then he goes further and says 10 million. That's a 40X ROI. You have to say the 40X piece. And then what I like to do is I like to pull it down as well and go, what if you had a crying baby? How much would you pay to have the baby stop crying? Right. It's a pain point. But so, if you have, and then I, what I like to do at times is I just pull the promise down, and I go, let's say you just get 10% margins. Then you're still getting a 20X return, right? Like that's where I like to go is even in a bad case scenario, here's your return. I like to just believe, make, make the promise a little more believable, give them a range of belief. That's, that's only my piece. But, no, I love that. But people stop at even, but they don't even do that. They go, no. you said it really well no. earlier, was yeah. they think about charging. That part's really good. Say yeah. that again. Like, so guys, like, and I won't do the whole thing right now, because we got- Crying baby I mean, and we're coming back. They're like, hey, I'll charge, I charge 10 grand, $10,000. It's like, why? Well, I wrote for Agora. I wrote for somebody, this is for copy, right? I wrote for some big guy. Okay, great, what the fuck does that mean for me? Like, why do I care? Or they're just like wanting to make more money and wanting to charge more, but they don't have any reason of justification. So it's like, tell me, I never, one giveaway here is like, if I talk to a prospective client, I never lead with my rate. And they'll ask me, I'm like, we'll get to that, but first. And it's not just like a sales technique, although it is, but it's because I want to actually know, okay, what are the numbers? Are they a good fit? Like, does it all match? And then if it's all a good match, then I will tell them what my rate is and I will paint the picture for them by doing the math. Versus just starting the call with, I charge ten thousand dollars. You don't open with doing the math, by the way. Right. Opening math or doing the math is a strong closing method. And so, one of the things that and Stephen said earlier, and it's, it's very true, is it doesn't matter what you charge; it matters what you produce. It matters what you return. You could charge, you could charge fifty thousand, but if you're returning five hundred thousand, it doesn't matter. You could charge five thousand if you return one thousand, you're a ripoff. Right. It doesn't matter what you charge, it matters what you produce, and how can you demonstrate what you're gonna produce in advance. Absolutely. So look, it's been a it's been a long flight. It's been the, one of the most fun flights of my whole life. We've had an incredible time. We made, we created a new product, the Entre Diaper. Yeah. We, uh, we made about seven, <laughs> six videos of Light Topaz and Richard then you can't go down. We made a beautiful infomercial. Uh, we, made, we made a baby. We made a baby cry. <laughs> we made a baby cry. We made a baby drink. We made a baby laugh. Yeah. I, we met. We met some cool pilots. We did. We, we learned stories. about the two falcon rule. We, learned, we listened to some loud noises, and uh, 
So if you guys are interested in learning any more stuff from us, there'll be ways for you to do that. We don't know what those are yet. Uh, if you want to come to the Freelancer Freedom event, even though it's probably not going to be called that, but it might be, I don't yeah. know, send an email to ian at feedthewolf.com. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, uh, this is the best close to a video ever because I'm like super distracted because I'm also he gets dad anxiety. My, he gets my dad daughter. anxiety. Huh? Um, yeah, like, like a total asshole, I know. Um, but yeah, it's just super fun. We have so much cool content. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Actually, the, the content of the conversations was really, I don't want really to say actually, I mean, of course it is, but it was amazing cool. content. Um, it was really yeah, fun talking. Fun. Yeah. I want to shoot more videos with you, Ann. I want to do that event down the road. Um, yeah, just really excited. This was awesome. On this, and then this also may have doubled as an entrepreneurs and vehicles getting beverages. And uh, what a vehicle to beverage in, you know? They get Macallan 12, which I just slip like three bottles into my backpack like a grown adult. But all right, thank you guys. I'm gonna do show, I'm gonna do finger guns like a murderer. Uh, I'll see you later. Bye guys.